Thank you. All right, well, let's dive right in. So um, I want to begin uh, just by thanking everyone for joining me this evening. I, I do hope that I'm able to provide some education on a, what's a very common uh, knee injury. And at the end, I'll be happy to try to answer as many of your questions uh, as there may be. Uh, but let me begin by introducing myself a little bit. Um, so I did grow up here in the suburbs of Philadelphia, so I'm native to the area. And as many of us, I'm a lifelong fan of all of our sports teams. Um, I attended college at Yale University um, and then uh, quickly came home to Philadelphia. I went to medical school at, at Jefferson, although it's uh, changed its name thanks to a very uh, generous gift by Sidney Kimmel. Um, and I stayed here for my residency as well, doing a residency in orthopedic surgery downtown at Jefferson and with Rothman Orthopedics. Um, I left and I did my uh, fellowship to get capstone training in orthopedic sports medicine surgery. And I did that at a place called the Stedman Clinic, which is in Vail, Colorado. Um, so sports have been a large part of my life. Uh, in high school, I was introduced, introduced to the sport of rowing, uh, and I was fortunate enough to compete uh, throughout college. Uh, when I returned to Philadelphia, um, I, I took the love of that sport, and I spent a number of years coaching high school rowing uh, here on Boathouse Row uh, while I was uh, simultaneously in medical school. Um, and starting in fellowship, I had the opportunity to uh, the unique opportunity to begin providing medical care for the US uh, ski and snowboarding teams. And I continue to serve as one of the assistant team physicians for US ski and snowboarding. And I primarily work with uh, the half pipe team. Um, so my specialty is, as we've mentioned, is sports medicine surgery. And obviously when people hear sports medicine, they often naturally think athlete. And while I do love sports and I love taking care of athletes, uh, sports medicine is about a lot more than just taking care of athletes. Sports medicine at its core is about treating injuries in a way that preserves our native joints instead of replacing them. And ultimately, my goal is to get people back to doing the things they love, regardless of what those things are. It can be chasing your kids or grandkids around the backyard. It can be getting back to the job that you love. It can be just playing weekend or recreational sports, or it can be organized sports. Um, so with all that in mind, today we're going to learn about an important structure in our knee that's very commonly injured, and that's the meniscus. So we're gonna start by defining what the meniscus is. And to do that, we have to look at the knee joint. The knee joint is formed by three bones. It's formed by the, uh, the lower end of the thigh bone, which we call the femur, the top end of the shin bone, which we call the tibia, and then the kneecap as well, so three bones. And we can see here, if we zoom in, we can see representations of the knee viewing it from the front and representation from the side and the same appearance on x-ray, which is one of the most uh, characteristic tools that we use to evaluate it. The surfaces of those bones are coated with what's called articular cartilage. And articular cartilage is a smooth, essentially frictionless surface. And that's what allows our joints to bend and move smoothly and painlessly. Unfortunately, adults have very limited ability to repair cartilage or grow new cartilage. We're born with a certain amount and that's all we get. So once it's worn out, that is the process of, of arthritis. And obviously we try to prevent injuries that may speed that process up. And so we can see very clearly if we look at these two x-rays here, both are looking at knees from the front. On the left, we see an x-ray of a, a normal healthy knee. We see space between the bones, the edges are smooth. And on the right, we see a joint that's developed arthritis. And the space between the, the bones is gone and there are large bone spurs that have formed. So the meniscus, is made of a different kind of cartilage, which is called fibrocartilage. And unlike articular cartilage, fibro fibrocartilage is soft and rubbery or elastic, almost like a sponge. Um, and it exists between the ends of the bone within the knee joint. It contains uh, fibers of collagen, but it's 65 to 75 percent water. And if you think of a, you know, a sponge, a sponge is a really good um, 
analogy for how the meniscus feels and acts. And you can imagine how it can absorb force um, like, a, like a sponge full of water. And so the meniscus is divided into two parts. There's an inner or medial meniscus, and there's an outer or lateral meniscus. Uh, they do have some differences, and we see the meniscus here in, highlighted in green. And so the medial meniscus is slightly uh, different shape, although they both look like a half moon. The medial meniscus is closer to a C shape. Both of them are attached at the very front and back by uh, attachment sites that we call roots, where they attach to the bone. The medial meniscus is very firmly attached along its periphery. That means it's not very mobile. And it covers about 50% of the medial surface of the joint. The lateral meniscus, by contrast, is a slightly different shape. It's more O-shaped. But just like the medial meniscus, it has anterior and posterior or front and back roots, attachments to the bone. But unlike the medial meniscus, it's very loosely attached, so it's more mobile, and that gives it some resistance to injury. A blood supply um, is necessary for healing to occur regardless of where injury happens in the body. And blood vessels are what brings uh, different cells and building blocks for tissue healing to occur when injury happens. The blood supply to the meniscus enters from the periphery of the joint, but unfortunately it doesn't penetrate the full meniscus. And we can see here in this, um, this section of a meniscus, we can see all these dark blood vessels out at the periphery, but we can see that the inner meniscus lacks those blood vessels. So it doesn't get the same nutrition. And so it doesn't have the same capacity to heal. And so we've devised a classification and we've divided the meniscus into three zones. And that peripheral zone we call the red, red zone. And that can heal because it has a good blood supply and it heals by scar formation, just like your skin heals when you have a cut. The next zone is the red, white zone and that's the borderline area. That's where there may be some capacity, but it's limited. And then finally, the inner portion of the meniscus which may be a substantial part of the meniscus, has no blood supply at all. And unfortunately, there's no healing potential there. So the meniscus serves three main functions. It transmits and distributes load. It acts as a shock absorber, like that sponge that we talked about. And it's a backup stabilizer. So our ligaments are the main stabilizers of our knee. But when they're injured, the meniscus can act as a backup. It acts as a wedge, like a doorstop, that prevents the joint from sliding too far. Um, part of how the meniscus uh, works, and we're going to get slightly technical here, um, is by making the surfaces of the joint match up better. It increases the congruency or matching of the joint, and it allows the load to be much more evenly shared over the uh, joint so that the uh, peak stress on any given area is, is lowered. And so when our knee is fully straight, the meniscus actually transmits 50 to 75% of the load. When our knee is bent, it's even more, up to 85%. And the presence of the meniscus is able to reduce stress on the surface of the joint by 100 to 200 percent, so it's substantial. And as the meniscus is lost or damaged or injured, those stresses go up and they can cause damage. They can cause damage to the joint surface, to the articular cartilage. And we can see here in this diagram on the left, the meniscus in blue is present and that allows the surface to match very nicely. So the pressures at the bottom stay low but on the right, the meniscus is gone. And the only area where the joint touches are, is in the center there. And the pressures that are seen there are very high. And that can exceed what the cartilage cells on the joint surface can withstand. And it can lead to significant injury. And it can incite the progression of arthritis. So there are two main ways for the meniscus to get injured. Uh, the first is an acute trauma, like a sports injury or a fall. Um, and this is uh, at highest risk during cutting and pivoting sports. Those are things like basketball, soccer, football, gymnastics, uh, skiing, wrestling. 
The second way that the meniscus can get injured is chronic degeneration. And so as we age, unfortunately, the meniscus does become weaker and injury can occur with less or even no notable trauma. Um, and some studies have shown that as we age, we all develop some injury to the meniscus, some tears. And above the age of 65, if you take people who have no knee pain and you put them in an MRI scanner, 75% of them may show some wear and tear on the meniscus. But if they don't have symptoms, we don't worry about those kinds of tears. Um, we consider those to be what's called an incidental finding. Um, tears of the medial meniscus are generally more common. And we discussed why that might be. The medial meniscus is less mobile. So when the knee twists, it doesn't have a ability to compensate and it tears. The only exception to that is, is when an ACL injury occurs. And that's the main case where the lateral meniscus tends to get injured. Um, injury can result in all different uh, patterns of meniscus tear. And we see a number of them here. Uh, these aren't all the ways that it can tear. Um, and there are some different descriptions. So the same tear can be described in a number of different ways, depending on uh, how the radiologist or the surgeon may describe it. But the patterns is important because it can impact how they're, they're treated. And so uh, here we have another de depiction of, of different types of tears. And the types of tears that are common in young patients, particularly with acute injuries, are the vertical types of tears, the oblique or parrot beak types of tears, or the longitudinal tears. As we age and we start to see more degenerative breakdown of the meniscus, that tends to be different patterns. And those are things like horizontal, complex, and degenerative. And if you have an MRI and you see the radiologist describe this in certain ways, what they're trying to do is give the surgeon a sense of what pattern the meniscus tear may be. These degenerative tears, the horizontal, the complex, they can also be associated with cysts which is where joint fluid leaks out of the joint and collects in other spaces around the knee. So how does the meniscus get injured? Well, you may hear or feel a pop when the meniscus tear occurs. Oftentimes that's the case in acute injuries, but it doesn't always happen that way. Pain typically localizes to the location of the injury. So if the medial meniscus is torn, typically you have inner knee pain. If the lateral meniscus is torn, you typically have outer knee pain. There may be swelling. In some cases, it can be very significant, can happen within the first couple days of injury. Sometimes it's persistent and it may come and go. Many people describe mechanical symptoms when they sustain a meniscus injury. They can feel locking where they're unable to feel like they can fully bend or straighten their knee. They can feel clicking, popping, or snapping as an unstable flap of meniscus um, moves back and forth inside the joint. Or they can have a sense of instability where the knee feels like it wants to give out on them, where they feel like they can't trust it. So how do we evaluate it? Well, first, your doctor is going to ask you a series of questions that are designed to determine a couple things. Um, your desired activity level and your goals moving forward, whether you had an acute injury or if your symptoms came on gradually, whether your symptoms line up with those that we just described for a meniscus tear. Where is your pain? Do you have swelling? Do you have locking, clicking, popping, instability? whether you've ever had prior injuries to this knee and whether you've ever had prior treatments to this knee. And that often includes things like injections or prior surgeries. Next, your, your doctor will examine your knee and typically they'll compare the injured knee to the uninjured knee, looking for differences and asymmetries between the two. They're gonna assess for the presence of swelling. When fluid collects inside the joint, we call that an effusion, so they'll feel for that. They're gonna look for tenderness and pain, particularly at the joint line where the meniscus is. And they're gonna feel both the medial and the lateral meniscus to see if they can localize the injury. And finally, they're gonna check your range of motion to make sure that the knee is not locked. A number of special maneuvers have been described for diagnosing uh, meniscus tears and your doctor may perform these as well. 
None of these, unfortunately, are perfect. A positive test doesn't guarantee that a meniscus injury is the culprit. A negative test doesn't completely rule out the presence of a meniscus tear. But a number of them are quite useful. And overall, they contribute to the picture that we use um, to put together our diagnosis. In addition to taking your history and examining you, imaging of the knee is important for diagnosing a meniscus tear. Uh, X-rays are generally the first type of in imaging study that we use. Um, these can be obtained very quickly and they can be done right in the office at your first appointment. And although many people worry about the exposure of radiation, it's very minimal. Um, obviously, any time we go on a, an airplane, we're up in the atmosphere and we get a, uh, exposed to some radiation during that flight. And modern x-ray machines uh, expose us to about the same amount of radiation. So it's not a significant concern. X-rays are able to show, show bones uh, with great clarity, but they don't clearly show soft tissues, things like muscles, tendons, ligaments, and cartilage like the meniscus. So even though they can't show us a meniscus tear directly, they are very important for showing us other things. First and foremost, particularly if there was acute injury, we want to rule out that a fracture occurred because a fracture or broken bone um, can similarly cause pain, and we want to make sure that's not what we're dealing with first. And then secondly, we want to evaluate for the presence of any pre-existing or coexisting arthritis. Either of these things could significantly impact your treatment if a meniscus tear is subsequently found. If a meniscus tear is suspected um, and there's minimal arthritis, typically your doctor will next order an MRI. An MRI is a special advanced imaging study that uses a powerful magnet like the one seen in this photo to generate an image of your knee. And unlike x-rays, MRIs can show us soft tissue like the meniscus directly. The nice thing about MRI is that there's no radiation involved. You may see advertising for MRIs. Um, and so oftentimes they'll talk about the strength of the magnet, the most common are 3T or 3 Tesla or 1.5T, 1.5 Tesla. And the strength of the magnet determines how sharp the image is. So 3T MRIs are high resolution MRIs. MRIs do exist for patients who uh, struggle with claustrophobia and are unable to get an MRI, but they do come at a cost because unfortunately they generate a lower resolution image, which can be a little bit grainy compared to the sharp images produced by a closed MRI. When your doctor uh, evaluates uh, your MRI, they will look for a tear. And there are a number of photos here demonstrating tears of the meniscus, but they're also gonna look at all the structures inside your knee. They're gonna look for tendon injuries, ligament injuries, damage to that articular cartilage that may not have been seen on your x-rays, um, the presence of arthritis, and all of these things overall will, will paint a picture for your doctor and can impact the treatment that they may recommend. So how do we treat a meniscus after we've diagnosed it? Well, generally speaking, treatment's divided into two categories, non-operative, and operative involving surgery. And your doctor will make a recommendation on one of the two of those based on a number of factors. The most important of which are your desired activity level, the presence of arthritis or other injuries in your knee, and the capacity for healing that, that the meniscus tear may have. So non-operative treatment is uh, generally directed at symptom management. This is frequently utilized when a meniscus tear occurs in the existing of, or in the setting of coexisting arthritis. Um, the mainstays of non-operative treatment are the common things that you might think of: rest, ice, anti-inflammatories, temporarily modifying your activities until the inflammation from the injury calms down. And in the setting of arthritis, we may consider injections. And I'm sure many people have known someone who's had an injection. The most common type of injection that we do for arthritis and for uh, meniscus tears in the setting of arthritis is cortisone. But there are also additional injections that can be tried. And those are things like gel 
lubricant visco supplementation injections. Um, there are a number of, of reasons why your surgeon may recommend uh, treating your meniscus tear operatively. And those may be that your symptoms um, of your meniscal injury are, are seriously interfering with either the activities of daily living, your ability to do your job, or your ability to participate in the sport that you want to. Your physical exam findings have to match those of a symptomatic meniscal tear. As we discussed before, sometimes we see meniscus tears incidentally on MRIs because MRIs are a very sensitive tool. Um, but if it doesn't line up with the symptoms that you're having, we don't worry about it quite as much. So they have to line up. Um, obviously, in, in many cases, we'll attempt non-operative treatment first because the risks are lower. Um, but if non-operative treatment fails, that's another reason to proceed to surgical treatment. And then finally, of course, we want to make sure that we've ruled out the possibility of other injuries. Modern meniscus surgery is typically performed arthroscopically, and that means it's done uh, with a camera and small instruments about the size of a pen um, through tiny poke hole incisions, no larger than uh, the width of your pinky finger. Uh, this is the gold standard for determining the size, location, and pattern of the meniscus tear. MRI can give us a sense of what to expect, but it's not as precise as looking at an arthroscopy. And so as a result, some decisions about how to treat a meniscus tear can't be made before the tear is seen at surgery, when we truly understand where it exists relative to that blood supply and whether it's possible to do something like a repair. So uh, the main decision, as I alluded to, is whether to repair the meniscus, perform a meniscus repair, or trim out the damaged portion. That's a partial meniscectomy. A lot of that is determined by where the injury occurs relative to the blood supply and the ability for healing to take place, even if we stitch it together. Your surgeon will take into account your age, the presence of coexisting arthritis, the pattern and location of the tear, the, the likelihood of healing based on the blood supply, as well as your ability to comply with the sometimes difficult post-operative restrictions and post-operative rehabilitation that can go along with performing a repair. At a minimum, we only uh, repair tears that have some capacity to heal. And those are the ones that are out closer to the blood supply on the periphery of the meniscus. Meniscus repair is one technique. Um, there are multiple uh, different ways to perform this, different instruments that can be uh, utilized depending on the location uh, of your tear and the best way to access it, whether it's in the back or posterior meniscus, whether it's in uh, the side of the meniscus or the mid body as we call it or the anterior portion of the meniscus up front. Um, sutures are typically passed through the tear to seal it together while it hopefully heals through that scar formation, just like uh, your skin healing from a cut. Unfortunately, even if a tear is stitched together, some don't always heal and some repairs unfortunately do re-tear. Partial meniscectomy or trimming um, is performed if the tear is not a candidate to be repaired. And in that case, we trim out the damaged portion. And this photograph shows different patterns of tears. And the zone in gray is basically the area that is trimmed out to restore a smooth margin to the meniscus and to remove all damaged tissue. When we do it, we do it to remove the smallest amount of meniscus possible to completely remove the damaged tissue. So there's nothing left to either get stuck in the joint, to cause damage to the joint surface, or to propagate and get larger over time. Your post-operative rehabilitation is determined whether you had a meniscus repair or a trim, a partial meniscectomy. And the meniscus repair rehab is slower. And that's done in order to protect the repair while the tear is hopefully healing. There are three main phases for rehab of a meniscus repair. 
the first, like we talked about, is protection, protecting the joint while the tear heals. And we typically do that for the first six weeks. And depending on the, the pattern of tear and the type of repair that was performed, you may have limitations during this time. You're typically going to be in a knee brace. You may be limited. You may not be able to bend your knee beyond 90 degrees. And you may not be able to put full weight on it. You may require the use of crutches or a walker for that six week period. After that, everyone develops a little bit of stiffness. So the next six weeks focus on restoring normal motion to the knee and beginning strengthening. Beyond week 12, we focus on strengthening and return to higher level activities like sports. And that's introducing things like running and agility. But ultimately, after a meniscus repair, we would expect a patient, as long as the repair is successful, to have no long-term restrictions on what we would allow them to do. Partial meniscectomy rehab can be significantly faster. We don't have to repair anything because we removed all the damaged tissue. So you're allowed to put weight on the limb immediately. You can bend and straighten it without a specific limitation. People have soreness um, immediately after surgery. We see you two weeks after surgery just to make sure the incisions are closing nicely. And we start PT if it's necessary to help restore your motion. But most people are back pretty much to normal between six weeks and three months. So it's a recovery that's about twice as fast as a meniscus repair rehab. So to summarize things before we open everything up to questions, the meniscus is an important structure in the knee. It acts as a shock absorber and it helps to distribute load to prevent damage to the cartilage, which is what arthritis is. Injury to the meniscus, unfortunately, is very common. It can occur with or without trauma, depending on what stage in life we are. And unfortunately, only a portion of the meniscus has the blood supply and the ability to heal, even with surgery. And if a meniscus injury is suspected, your doctor will go through uh, the methodical approach that we talked about, taking your history, examining your knee, reviewing your x-rays, and often ordering an MRI. If there's existing arthritis, typically we'll begin with non-operative treatment and that's likely the appropriate place to start. If you have surgery, it will likely be done arthroscopically through poke hole incisions with a camera. It'll invo either involve repair of the meniscus or trimming of the damaged portion. And then the rehab will depend on the specific pattern of your injury, the specific procedure that was performed. But generally speaking, first we protect the joint to allow it to heal, and then we focus on eventual restoration of motion and strength. And so for that, I will uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Sakati. You gave us a lot of good information here. So um, we appreciate you taking the time. Um, the first question we have, and again, um, there's a little dialog box at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. You can just type in your questions there and we'll go through them. Uh, so somebody wrote in, why is MRI not for knee with arthritis? So that's a great question. You can uh, get an, an MRI with a knee for arthritis, um, but in many cases, we may attempt non-operative treatment first um, because even if we get the MRI, that's, that's going to be the appropriate place to start either way. Um, so in a lot of this is, is nuanced beyond what I, what I talk about, talked about, and it depends on the specifics of your exam in the office. Um, but if I see a patient and they have substantial arthritis, unfortunately, but their exam is okay, they don't have a locked knee, they don't have uh, clicking or popping, then I may suggest that rather than get an MRI right away, we start treatment. And we only proceed to an MRI if that treatment is unsuccessful. All right, thank you. Uh, next question, I was told my meniscus tore from the root. What is that? So a meniscus root tear is a particular pattern of meniscus injury 
Um, we talked a little bit about how the meniscus is attached to the bone and it has firm attachment sites where the meniscus dives into the bone in the front and the back. And it can occasionally sustain a tear right at that attachment site. Um, and that can have uh, an impact on the technique that's used to uh, treat that. Typically, we try to repair those if there isn't advanced arthritis in the joint. Um, and that means that, unfortunately, the, the rehab from a meniscus root repair can be a little bit more involved. And, and oftentimes, uh, you will have to spend a couple weeks on crutches um, to protect that repair. Okay. Uh, two people wrote kind of the same question. So um, if someone thinks I skipped them, it's just because it's basically the same question, just different wording. Uh, if you have meniscus repair or removal, are you more likely to require knee replacement later in life? Is there anything to do to delay or prevent this? Yeah, so that's a great question. It's one that I get very frequently. Um, unfortunately, we do believe that having the injury in the first place likely increases the risk of developing some arthritis down the road, regardless of how we treat it. Some of that is just a result of the injury, and we can't unwind the clock, so to speak, to, to remove that, that increased risk. But we think that we are able to prevent things from getting rapidly worse by treating the meniscus tear, particularly if it can be repaired or if it's an unstable tear where the meniscus tissue that's damaged may be flapping back and forth and, and abrading against or, or damaging those cartilage surfaces. How common is a meniscus tear on a knee that has been replaced? So uh, fortunately, if you've had a knee replacement, your meniscus is actually removed at the time of a knee replacement. So it's impossible to get a meniscus tear on a knee that has been replaced. Had a small meniscus tear treated only with PT for six weeks. It's five years later and I have no residual pain. Could the meniscus have healed? Um, the short answer to that is yes. Um, we do think that small, very peripheral tears with a good blood supply can heal. Um, this is a subset of injuries. Um, so the majority of meniscus uh, tears probably can not heal, um, but that doesn't mean that, that some can't heal. And this is exactly the reason why we often try non-operative treatment first, because it absolutely can work. Okay. Is meniscus repair trim, is that a good option for a healthy 75-year-old who has serious arthritis and bone on bone? So that's, a, so that's a great question. And this is something that uh, we as a uh, medical profession have grappled with, with a great deal of research over the last 20 to 25 years. And we've looked at the success rate of meniscus surgery, arthroscopic meniscus surgery, um, when there's existing arthritis. And unfortunately, even though we address the meniscus, the arthritis is still there. And so oftentimes patients who have substantial arthritis, if they have an arthroscopy, they don't feel as good after surgery. Some of them don't feel better at all. And that's why we're hesitant to recommend arthroscopic meniscus surgery if there's severe arthritis. In those circumstances, we may try either the non-operative treatments that I described or the more reliable surgical treatment may be a knee replacement. Again, it all, it all depends on the specifics of the injury, but speaking generally. Uh, what happens if the MRI is not enough information on the location of the tear, ligament meniscus area? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, oftentimes, uh, the, fortunately, uh, those circumstances are limited. 
um, usually we're able to get a reasonable sense of uh, where the injury is um, with some degree of, of specificity. Um, nothing can uh, compete with seeing it in person as an arthroscopy. If there is a question of where it is and what kind of healing capacity it might have, then that's a conversation that I'll often have with my patients about whether they want to proceed directly to surgery or whether they want to, um, whether they want to give non-operative treatment a try first. Um, and then obviously anyone who tries non-operative treatment and fails, we always have arthroscopy as a backup. Um, I think you answered this, but I want to just um, repeat it. I was told that if my repair, if they repair my nisket, re, sorry, I was told that if they repair my meniscus, I will eventually need a knee replacement. Should I just go for the knee replacement? So th this is another question that I get very frequently in, in the office because it's a really important one. And um, your individual circumstances are really important. So the question is, um, how much arthritis is there? What is your age? Um, because while knee replacement can be a phenomenal surgery at providing improved function and reduced pain in an arthritic knee, they are mechanical parts. And although they've gotten substantially better in the last few decades, um, they have an, an expiration date. We think that modern prostheses or, or knee replacements um, the materials that we use for them have a tremendous shelf life, and we think that that's anywhere in the range of 15 to 25 years. But if you put an artificial knee in a patient who's younger, who's say 50 years old, um, that's going to wear out at some point. And when they're 65 or 70 or 75, they may be looking at having their knee replacement redone. So we do, in many circumstances, try to put off a knee replacement later in life, with the goal of only having to do one knee replacement during your lifetime. But I tell my patients that if your symptoms are severe enough and knee replacement's the answer, then don't live suffering. You know, if, if you're really impacted to the point where you can't do any of the things that you need to do or want to do, then you should think about getting treatment regardless of what your age is. And if that means putting a knee replacement in a little bit younger than earlier or younger than usual, then that can be the right answer sometime. And it can have a dramatic life-changing impact and really open you back up to many of the things that you might want to do. Uh, should I restrain from walking if my knees hurt more than walking one mile? Um, so that's a good question as well. Um, we have done research looking at the impact of activity level on damaging our joints. And we've never been able to scientifically uh, prove that walking more or running more, longer distances, more frequently, is directly related to how much damage develops in the joint. So in one sense, the answer is um, you don't have to limit yourself if you don't want to. It won't necessarily cause more damage, but it can cause pain. And again, I, I come back to you know what I frequently tell my patients is you know don't allow yourself to suffer. And so many patients who find that they do have activity-related pain, they either cut down on that activity to a level that they can tolerate or they consider replacing it with other activities. And when we do have you know, meniscal damage or arthritis, typically the activities that are best tolerated are low impact ones. So instead of running, jogging, walking, which are pounding high impact activities, we replace it with low impact activities like cycling, the elliptical, anything in the pool is fantastic. I know that access to pools has been more challenging during the pandemic, but the buoyancy in the water really takes uh, the pressure off our joints and, and can be a great form of exercise with, uh, with an injured joint. Okay. Uh, artificial meniscus possible in the future? So absolutely. Um, although I would say it is likely not in the next five to 10 years. Um, there is a lot of 
active work being done on this. And uh, there are some surgeons in Europe who are doing some early work with artificial meniscus replacement. Um, but as of right now, it's not widely commercially available um, and it's not FDA approved uh, in the United States. Okay, uh, next question. I have torn, I have a torn, or I have torn meniscuses in both knees. Both knees confirmed via MRI. Any issue or concerns in not taking surgical action if both knees are no longer hurting me? Left knee 13 years and right knee two years. So, um, it's wonderful that neither of your knees are, are hurting you anymore. Um, and so oftentimes I tell my patients that, um, why would you expose yourself to surgical risk when you don't have an injury that you're treating, you don't have symptoms that you're treating. So surgery doesn't have an ability to make you much better than you already are. Um, and it comes with risks. Even if the risks for arthroscopy are low, in comparison to some other surgery, they're still there. And so I, I don't recommend taking unnecessary, unnecessary risks. Um, the fact that you had a meniscus tear, like we talked about before, could it contribute to development of arthritis down the road? Yes, it, it could. Um, but I would, I would certainly um, treat you based on your current symptoms um, and not so much on a prior injury. I had a meniscus repair along with tibial plateau fracture repaired with plate. What is the likely future of the, these two repairs? Yeah, so that's a great question. And um, we didn't talk about, we talked about this not specifically, I, I uh, referred to it, is that meniscus tears can happen um, in combination with other injuries. And we frequently see them happen with um, broken tibias, tibial plateau fracture is a type of fracture of the upper end of the tibia or shin bone where it enters the knee joint and the meniscus can be damaged at the same time. The most effective way to prevent future issues with that joint is to treat it exactly the way that you were treated, a meniscus repair and uh, treatment, open reduction, internal fixation is the, the term that we use. Um, treating that, that fracture to line it up correctly so it heals in good position with a plate. Um, we do think that, unfortunately, just having the injury in the first place likely increases your risk to some degree that you could develop arthritis down the road, but it's hard to predict exactly what that risk is. And it may be years before you develop um, any issues, years or even decades. Uh, would you recommend non-operative options for the weekend warrior types more so than a active high school athlete? So my uh, personal philosophy for uh, treating patients is uh, one of shared decision making. So I take the patient who is sitting across from me um, and age is just a number. You know, we, we all know people who are um, the, the number of their age is, is higher than you know, their activity level. We know people who are younger, who don't do quite as much, who don't have as high demands. So age is just a number. Um, and although it, it can point us in one direction or another, I don't allow it to be the sole determinant of my treatment recommendation. So typically I spend a lot of time going through a lot of this conversation when I have a patient in the office and we've just gone through their MRI and we've talked about whether they have a, a meniscus injury and whether they have some arthritis. And we come up with the decision together over what the most appropriate you know, treatment is. And for some people, they really strongly want to try non-operative treatment. And I'll let you know if I feel like that is not necessarily the right call in the long term. But if it's reasonable, then that's what we'll do because that's what you want to do. And the converse is true as well. If the patient really wants to address their issues surgically, oftentimes I'll be willing to do that, but I'm going to be very honest with you how likely I think it is that it's going to remove all your symptoms 
And if you have arthritis, there's a possibility that if we do an arthroscopy to treat your meniscus tear, you can still have some knee pain from the arthritis. And so I'll, I'll do it in some cases in those circumstances, as long as my patient has a good understanding that at, at the end of the day, they may still have some issues from their arthritis. Um, I presume weight loss and good diet hydration would be good, a good idea regardless of age and extent of damage, DJD. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a, a really uh, good point to make and one that I didn't talk about in my, um, in my presentation um, with, because I, I didn't want to get too lost in the nitty gritty of the biomechanics of our knee joint. But the reality is in certain positions, our knee sees up to seven to eight times our body weight in terms of the forces that go through our knee. And so just to make the math easy, if we took a hypothetical person who was uh, small and skinny and weighed 100 pounds, then in certain positions and certain activities, seven to 800 pounds of force is going through their knees. That means that as we put on weight, we add significantly to the forces that go through our knees. And increased force increases the likelihood of damage. So any weight loss is good for our joints. The good news is that weight loss, the effect is magnified on our joints. If we lose five pounds from our weight overall, then that's 35 to 45 pounds off of our joints. And that's why I have patients where if they do feel like they could get into a little bit of a healthier weight range, even losing five to 10 pounds can make their joints feel substantially better without any other treatment. Just that simple um, minimal weight loss can take a lot of pressure off their joints. Um, and obviously we always recommend that you do that through a combination of exercise and healthy diet. And we talked about the exercise that I recommend. Um, and diet sometimes can be a, a challenging issue. We do have access through Rothman to nutritionists. So if you're interested in that as a service, we can help to ar arrange for you uh, to connect with a nutritionist as well to explore that as a possibility. Thank you. Um, questions are still coming in, which is great, but we may not be able to get to them all. Um, I just wanna like jump in and quickly say again, if you do need to make an appointment with Dr. Sakati, he is in our Glen Mills um, off and uh, Northeast office. And we just, the phone number is 610-480-6584. Again, 610-480-6584 is the VIP number to reach him. Um, again, I'll try and answer or uh, ask a couple more questions, but I know they're still coming in hot. and. If we don't get to them all, uh, feel free to you um, have my email information on your invite, or you can call and make an appointment directly. So um, somebody also did say they do the reverse elliptical that tends to help soothe the knee. Um, someone yeah. wanted to know, is the tread climber a good exercise for someone with a meniscus tear in one knee and a total knee replacement in the other knee? Yeah, I can, I can answer both of those questions together. Um, so, and I touched on this a little bit, but the, the exercise that we think is um, easiest on our knee joint are exercises that we call closed chain exercise. And, and that's a, a, a fancy term for any kind of exercise where your foot does not leave the ground or whatever it's standing on. So, a bicycle, whether it's an, an outdoor bike, a road bike, or a stationary bike, your foot is on the pedal. Your foot never leaves the pedal. That's a closed chain exercise. The elliptical and the climber, as long as your foot is staying on the, the pedal or the platform, then that's a closed chain exercise. And those are ones that put the least amount of stress on our knee joint and are typically the ones that we recommend to patients who do have some joint issues. Um, what other treatment options do I have if I still want to live a semi-active lifestyle without surgery? I think you said physical therapy start there, but if, I don't know if you want to elaborate. Yeah, so, so we do uh, recommend uh, 
you know, certainly starting with the, the standard non-operative treatment, which is resting the injured joint, temporarily modifying your activity. There's a role for anti-inflammatory medications in some cases. Um, many patients will use physical therapy to get the, the joint moving more smoothly. Um, and then beyond that, we talked about a role for injections. Oftentimes, the first type of injection we use is cortisone. Cortisone is a steroid. It acts as an anti-inflammatory. Um, the goal there is not so much to incite a healing response, but really just to calm down an angry or inflamed joint. Um, beyond cortisone, we have the lubricant type injections. Uh, those go by many names and oftentimes we'll see marketing either in the newspaper, magazines, or sometimes on TV. Um, and those are essentially a synthetic version of the natural lubricating fluid um, in our joint. And so we know that when injury occurs in the joint, whether it's meniscus injury or arthritis, the composition of that lubricating fluid changes. Um, and so we think of the lubricant injections almost as an oil change, like the oil in your engine, keeping your uh, engine parts moving smoothly together. And so we think of it as an oil change, and hopefully we can get the joint moving more smoothly if we restore that natural balance. Um, so that's an option as well. There are other injections that we try in certain cases. Um, those are things that you may have heard of as well. They exist under the umbrella of um, term uh, biologic injections. So those are things like PRP, uh, which is a, an acronym for uh, platelet-rich plasma. There are also uh, treatments that somewhat inaccurately go under the category of stem cell treatments. They're not truly stem cells, um, but that captures people's imag imagination. Um, these treatments, there is some research that suggests that they can be effective depending on what your specific injury is. Um, they, both of them aim to isolate the healing and anti-inflammatory factors that naturally exist in our blood and delivering it to the source of uh, location of the injury. Um, the, the main problem with them, although we do provide them here at the Rothman Institute, is that your insurance doesn't recognize them. So, so no insurance typically recognizes this treatment. So they are available, but um, they do come at an, an out-of-pocket uh, cost. And, and sometimes those out-of-pocket costs uh, can add up. So I certainly, um, I never force those types of treatment on any patient um, because it can be a meaningful financial decision. Um, but if I have a patient who um, is really strongly interested in pursuing that kind of treatment and they understand um, some of the limitations and the fact that, you know, no uh, treatment guarantees success. If they want to try it, knowing all those things, then I'm happy to facilitate that. All right, I have two more questions. We are, we're going to try and wrap up before six, so one minute each. <laughs> I was diagnosed with a subchondral insufficiency fracture of tibial plateau and posterior horn tear of the medial meniscus. What's the usual treatment approach for this? Yeah, so this... Um, these can be challenging to treat, unfortunately. Um, and, and the reality is that subchondral insufficiency fractures can happen for a number of reasons. Um, it can happen if there was a uh, higher energy acute trauma that caused the meniscus tear. Um, and an insufficiency fracture is basically a deep bruising of the bone and if there's no significant arthritis, in many cases, I'd recommend treating the uh, meniscus tear um, independent of the insufficiency fracture, but I would caution that patient that patients with insufficiency fractures do tend to have pain after surgery from that bruise, bruise in the, the bone, and that pain can last for a couple of months before it resolves. There's another set of uh, patients where insufficiency fractures, unfortunately, can be a sign of arthritic change. Um, so without 
knowing a, a little bit more details of the case and without having a chance to see that MRI myself, it's it's hard to know, you know, which of those circumstances, you know, we're dealing with and exactly what my recommendations would be. Um, but gen generally speaking, that's that's the answer. Okay, and last question. Um, I'm, 40, or I'm 54 years old with a torn medial meniscus in addition to degenerative arthritis. I want the knee replacement because I want the quality of life to be better now, not later. Who makes the decision to approve knee replacement surgery as it correlates with insurance? Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I personally believe, and, and some of this is, is personal you know, treatment philosophy from the doctor you're working with. But I, you know, personally f believe that um, knee replacement is a quality of life decision that's made by the patient. And if you have arthritis and it's impacting your life, then whether you are 65 or 54 or 42, if knee replacement's the answer and you feel confident about that decision, then I'm happy to support that decision. So patients who come into my office and, and that's the scenario that we're dealing with, then you know I would do all the documentation in my note that would be then submitted to the insurance uh, uh, to, to help approve that knee replacement surgery. I don't do knee replacement surgery as part of my practice. So I would then connect that patient with one of my partners um, who do nothing but knee and hip replacement. And um, they would also help with uh, the process of having it approved by insurance. Typically that is not an issue. If there is arthritis there, um, usually it's not an issue getting that approved. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, thank you so much. Again, you gave us a lot of great information. There are still questions coming in, but you have my inform. Um, all the attendees do have my information. You can email me, or again, you can make an appointment to talk directly with Dr. Sakati um, when it relates to specifically about your body. Uh, the phone number is six one zero four eight zero six five eight four. He sees patients in both Glen Mills and the Northeast. Um, thank you all for attending and thank you, Dr. Sakati, for taking the time to do this tonight. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It was all a right. pleasure. Yes, take care.